All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Alexandria Covenant Church. If I could have you stand, we'll worship together. You know, every one of us have a testimony that we can share because Jesus Christ works in every person's life. And whether you've met him as a dear friend and know him as the savior of your life or you're just coming to know him, you know, the testimony of your life is that your life is hid in him. 
And that's the greatest testimony that we can have, that it's not about us, it's about him and what he does for our life and what he does in our lives. That's the testimony of our lives. I'm glad that you're here to celebrate that with us today. If you're online, we're glad that you're tuning in as well. I hope that you just feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in your house as we know that he comes and, and, and shares our time with us here as well. So let's just bow before him and ask God to come and, and let's invite him in. Let's make him become part of what's going on here. Dear Jesus, we just thank you again that you are a God who loves us dearly, that so much so that you took us as we are and made us into the people that you want us to be. You took us from being lost and brought us into your kingdom. You took us from being lost in sin and gave us a justified life that is now holy in you. And so, Father, we just praise you today. Be present with us here today. We just don't want to just go through some routine thing this now, this, this morning. We want you present, Father. We want to experience you, and we want to know you, and we want to get to know you better. And so come and meet with us here as we worship you now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue praising our God. trust in no matter what. In Psalm 71 too, it says, in your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me.
First century Christians faced many of the same challenges. So, John wrote them a last letter. This was a letter of hope that John could testify to. A reminder that no matter how dark it gets, Jesus is our advocate. Make plans this fall to take your faith to a new level. Well, we're at it again. We're back in our study on the book of 1 John. We're looking at the last letters of the gospel writer named John. I'm going to begin a little bit different today. I'm going to talk about another person just for a moment. I don't know if you, you know, if I throw out this name, if you would even know this name, ever heard of this name, but the name is Charles Templeton. My hunch is that if, if, if you probably have never heard that name and you probably don't recognize who he is. But let me throw out another name because I think you probably know this person and you probably would recognize his name when I say it. And his name is Billy Graham. Now that's a familiar name to most of us here. And most of us know that if you talk about an evangelist, he was one of the greatest evangelists in the, in the 20th century. And, and in fact, some of you have maybe, like I have, maybe you've all already attended one of his uh, crusades when they were, I mean, when they go through the United States, if you're an older member of our congregation, you probably, or you might have gone and, and actually gone to one of his, his crusades. He actually was in Minneapolis in 1973 for the crusade in Minneapolis. And it was then that I was able to be one of the counselors for that. So I was at all the meetings and I was able to just share the gospel. As he shared the gospel, I was able to confirm to the people who had come down into the front. And there were thousands that came down to the front of the, of the stadium there. And uh, we just shared with them the, the, what they had done in the receiving of Jesus Christ and saw many, many people come to faith. I mean, he was a man who had a huge impact in this world. But if you were around in the mid-20th century, in the maybe 1940s, 1950s, into the 1960s, it wasn't just Billy Graham that was making these evangelistic tours. It was a man named Charles Templeton along with Billy Graham. In fact, in the early days, Billy Graham and Charles Templeton did some evangelistic crusades together, and they would go across the United States, they would go over to Europe and have evangelistic crusades in Europe as well. And Templeton 
I mean, as good as we think Billy Graham is or was, Templeton was better. He was a great evangelist. His messages were clear and, and powerful. And he, and he was so good that if he continued on his, his pathway of, of leading evangelistic crusades, I, I'm, I would venture to say that we would not be hearing the name Billy Graham today. The name that we would be remembering is Charles Templeton. But we aren't. And most of you don't even know who he is. Because even though he was a great preacher, even though he was one of the most powerful evangelists that were around in the mid, middle part of the last century, what we discovered is he wasn't a Christian. He never really was a Christian. He, he had reservations and he had questions about what it meant to be a Christian, the essentials of the Christian faith. In fact, in 1957, he surprised the whole religious world, the community of faith, by saying publicly for the first time, I'm an agnostic. And 30 years later, in 1987, he would come out with a book, publishing his spiritual memoirs, and here's the title of it, Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian faith. Now, I want to raise a question here with you, and here's the question. How does a man who was considered to be one of the greatest evangelists of his day, leading, and I'm not kidding, leading thousands and thousands of people to genuine faith in Jesus Christ, how is it that he can end up rejecting his faith and walking away from God? And here's a more important question for us. Is it possible that what happened to Charles Templeton could happen to us? Could it happen to you? Could it happen to me? Could, could I be a person who has deep faith, strong devotion, love for Jesus, genuine conversion to Christ, and then one day, decide that's it and write my spiritual memoirs farewell to God well, that's what we're going to talk about in the passage that we're looking at this morning because grandpa John grandpa John wants us to understand that you know what when we see people walk away from faith like Charles Templeton did he was, he's going to remind us that it's not because they had a genuine faith and lost it. It's because he never had faith. And so when he talks about people in the church, he wants us to know that mixed in the church are those who possess a genuine faith and those who only appear to have a genuine faith. Now, he's not saying for us to try to figure out who they are in the church. I mean, we're not supposed to be doing those inspections. But what he is saying is that when we see somebody walk away, see, what he wants us to understand is they never really knew Christ. Now remember, John is writing this for the whole purpose of his letter is so that we would come to know that we know that we know in the depth of our knowing that that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ that gives us a hope of eternal life. And so what he wants us to understand as he begins this letter, and he'll make it the point that he writes this so that we may know that we have eternal life. Remember how we said that in, in 1 John 5, 13? He says, I write these things to you that you may know that you have eternal life. So, and here's Jampa John writing this final letter to the community of faith in his generation. And he's in his 90s at this point. He's been a disciple of Jesus. He's watched all the disciples martyred for their faith. He, he could have been martyred for her, his faith as well. But so somehow, God preserved his life, brought him through a boiling in oil, only for him to be able to be sent on by Emperor Domitian to an island called Patmos, where he'd be probably spending the rest of his life. But we don't understand what happened because he someday will leave that. That island, go back to the mainland, and he'll go to back to the city of, of Ephesus and there become the pastor of that church in Ephesus in his 
90s, and he writes this letter then to these believers in the church at Ephesus and also to the church at large, and he writes this letter to encourage believers in the faith so that they might know, that they might know in the depth of their knowledge that they have eternal life so that you and I don't have to worry that we might do something like Charles Templeton did in his life when he said, farewell, God. Farewell, God. Now, here's what John is going to do in the passage that we're looking at today. He's going to give us three reasons why. As I looked at this passage, I I, I found three reasons why, if we really know Christ, that we have nothing to fear. If, 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 we, if we really know Christ, we have nothing to fear that, that the pathway that Charles Templeton took is a pathway that we might take as well. And so if you're here today, and, you, and here's what you're wondering, could I be the one who would walk away from the faith? Could I be the one who would not remain faithful to, uh, you know, my, my commitment to Christ? John wants us, here, John is wanting to set our hearts at ease that we have nothing to fear and that we don't have to worry that that could happen to us. So here's what I want to talk about today. I want to give you the three reasons why you and I were not needing to be worried about being like a Charles Templeton. Here's the first reason. Real Christians, here's what John wants us to know, real Christians remain in the church. Real Christians remain in the community of faith. And if we're a real Christian, we'll remain in the community of faith. Because the mark of of a real Christian is that they do remain. And John, in fact, John will use that term remain or abide. Some of your Bibles will talk about abiding. That he'll use it in a, a number of times in this short little letter. So here's how he says it in verse 18, though. Dear children, remember, he's talking, about a, uh, he's talking to his kids as a grandpa would talk to his kids. And he's wanting to share with them the truth that he's come to know and he wants them to get to know as well. And so he, he talks to them and he'll say, dear children, dear little children, my dear little children. So he says, dear children, this is the last hour. I mean, he wants to affirm to the fact that, 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 that Things are moving along in history, and he's saying, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, and this is how you know that this is the last hour. They went out from us, but they, were not really, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but in their going out showed that none of them belonged to us. Now, th- it's interesting you think, oh, what is he getting at? Why is he bringing this whole thing up that this is the last hour? There's Antichrist in the church. There is an Antichrist coming. Why is he doing all that? Because what John wants us to know is that if we really are true believers, we're not like the Antichrist. That's what he's saying. It's the Antichrist is the one who's opposed to Christ. And he says, this is the last hour. And there will come a day, and he wants us to know that there will come a day, that, and, and they knew this, that you know that the, that the Antichrist will come. And so he says, you know that. You know that the Antichrist will show up. And, and so he'll come, but what he wants us to also know is that before that individual comes onto the stage of world history who will be opposed to Christ, will come in the place of Christ, so that people will think, man, that person is Christ. And we know that's going to happen when the Antichrist comes because people are going to think, boy, that's Christ. And John wants us to know that that spirit of an Antichrist that comes looking like Christ but isn't Christ is already in the church. And the way that we know that somebody is of the spirit of Antichrist is this, that they don't remain. And so John is telling us, his spiritual children, you know that the Antichrist is coming, but there are Antichrists already here and they're already in operation in the world. I mean, and what he's referring to are people who, well, here's how he says it. Every spirit, so it's a spirit of Antichrist, every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. I mean, every spirit, every individual, every, every under idea that questions the fact of Jesus being from God, that he can't really have come from God, John says, this is a spirit of the Antichrist. 
which you have heard is coming and even now is in the world already. And so John begins by saying, this is the last hour, we're in the last hour, we know this is the last hour, and how we know this is the last hour is because there are men who are in the church who are anti-Christ, who are leaving the faith and trying to convince others that the, that the truth about Jesus is not real. What I'm talking about with Jesus in your life is not true. And so how do you spot somebody who has a spirit of Antichrist? How do you spot them? Well, the, again, we're not trying to spot people, but John's saying, here's how you do spot them if it, if it becomes clear that they are the ones who don't remain. They don't remain in the fellowship because they are not of the fellowship of believers. In other words, the evidence that somebody is not genuine is they break ties with other believers. And the way we know that their faith is not genuine is they go out from the community of faith. In fact, John says, this is how you can tell if somebody is a true Christian compared to a, a one who only claims to be a Christian. They don't remain. And you and I have met people like that, haven't we? We've met people in the church who seem to be Christians, they make the claim to be Christians. They seem to have the identity with Christians. They join the Christian fellowship. They, they see, but all of a sudden, they break ties. And they walk away from the faith. And they do just like Charles Templeton did. And we're left with, I thought they were a Christian. I believe they were a Christian. But what John's saying is, no, they're not. They never were. And it's just becoming known to us because they walk away from the faith. We saw it happen this last year, didn't we? We saw some high-profiled Christians lead the faith and tell people that they were leaving the faith. Joshua, his name was uh, Joshua Harris, pastored. He, he pastored a church of 4,000 members. In fact, he was invited to become the pastor of that church after he wrote a book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. It's not a great book. And uh, I didn't ever recommend it, but uh, some people did. But you know what? As, as people, as this church saw the notoriety that he had in writing that book, they said, you want to be, why don't you be our pastor? And he accepted the role. And so he, he went and he became senior pastor of a, a church 4,000 members strong. And then last year, he writes on Instagram, announces on Instagram that he was separating his, from his wife after 20 years. And then nine days later, he said, by any definition of a Christian, I no longer am. And what did he do? He excommunicated himself from the church, and he walked away from his faith and his connection with the body of Christ. I mean, that's just one. We saw another high-profile Christian do the same thing last year as well, where he denounced his faith. He was a musician, songwriter, Hillsong music. His name was Marty Sampson, member of the Hillsong band. What did he do? He came out and made public, and he said, it was amazing being one of you, but I am not one anymore. And the question that people will ask is, see, how did they lose their faith? And John will say this. They didn't lose their faith. They never had a faith. They never had a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. They never did come to know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. So according to John and according to the Bible... The Bible doesn't teach that we can lose our faith. What the Bible teaches is that this, that people can fake salvation. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, a genuine believer, you can't lose your salvation. But what you can do is you can fake your salvation. And we know somebody who did that really well. His name was Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' disciples. Let me read, read what John will say about this. They went out from us, these people that he's talking about here who have a fake salvation. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going out showed that none of them belonged to us. See, 
he, what does he say? He's saying, you can't lose your salvation, but you can fake your salvation, just as I said, just like Judas Iscariot did. I mean, he walked with Jesus. He made a commitment to follow Jesus. He was in the band of the 12 disciples. He looked like all the other disciples. In fact, he must have been the kind of guy that people thought was a trustworthy guy because the, Jesus put him in charge of keeping the money of the group. So, I mean, if, if you were one of the other disciples and you need a little extra cash, who would you go to? You'd go to Judas Iscariot and say, hey, can I have, I, got, I want to go buy, you know, some food for the family. Can I get some food from, from you? Yeah, here's some. Can I get, I need some new clothes. Can I get, yeah, yeah, here, take this. So it was Judas who was the one who was, who was the manager of the funds that they had as that band of disciples. But here's what Jesus said of him in John chapter 6. He says, have I not chosen you, the 12? Have I not chosen all of you, the 12? And one of you is a devil. He's talking about Judas, wasn't he? Because what Jesus saw was this. He was a faker. He was a phony. And when he finally betrayed Jesus, it was a surprise to everybody else. But Jesus knew. See, where you and I can't tell, Jesus can tell. Where you and I can look at others and think, they look genuine. They've got to have a faith. I mean, every one of the other disciples would have been convinced that, that Judas was just as committed to Christ as they were. But Jesus was able to see the truth. And the thing that became clear to them is that remember when, when on that night, when Jesus was with his disciples in that upper room, what did Judas do? He went out from them. And he got plans together to have Jesus arrested in the garden. He didn't remain. He went out, and that became the evidence to the others that he really was the betrayer, that he never did have faith. See, the reason why Jesus, or Judas betrayed Jesus is because he never made Jesus the center of his life. And you think of, you think of Peter... When, when Peter saw all these other people walking away from Jesus, Jesus had preached the message. People were thinking, this is too hard for us to believe. This is too hard for us to understand. We can't be following him any longer. And all these people decided, I mean, this is in the account of Scripture, that all these people be, began to say, okay, we're done with following Jesus. Jesus looked at, at Peter and said, well, how about you, Peter? What are you going to do? Are you going to leave me as well? And, and, and Peter says, Lord, who else can we go to? I mean, you're the only one that has the words of life. If we, if we walk away from you, we walk away from life. And, and so he knew that he had, I mean, no matter how hard it was for him to hear what was being said and to watch others leave and depart, he knew that for him, He had to remain. You know, we can't judge the hearts of other people, can we? But what we can do is we can see if they remain in the faith. And John says if they don't remain with us, it's a good sign they were never a part of us. And so when you, you see a person like Charles Templeton write a book called Farewell to God, it doesn't tell us that he lost his faith. What it does tell us, though, is that he never had a faith. So he's not walking away from faith, but he's just simply walking away from the community of faith. And so John writes this and says, if you're a real Christian, you will remain in the church. You will remain connected to the community of of faith. Here's the other thing. It's already up on the screen. There's another mark that authenticates a person's faith, and that is this. Real Christians remain in the truth. You can put that back up on the screen one more time. Real Christians remain in the truth. See, not only do they remain in the church, but they remain in the truth. And, and here's how John says it. Verse 20, he says, but you have an anointing from the Holy Spirit, and all of you know the truth. You've been given an anointing, not by the, from the Holy Spirit, but from the Holy One. He's making a reference to God, the Holy One. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, 
And all of you know the truth. Now, who's a, what's, the, who, what's the anointing that we have? Well, the anointing is the Holy Spirit. That's what he's talking about here. So you have an anointing from the Holy One, which is the Holy Spirit, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie comes from the truth. Okay? As I said, he's talking about an anointing that's upon every one of our lives if we're a true, genuine follower of Jesus Christ. And the anointing that we have is the Holy Spirit who's been given to us by God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. And when you and I became Christians, when we accepted Christ as our Savior, Jesus Christ put his Spirit within us. Now, I'll guarantee that if you became a, a believer as an adult later in life, probably even as a child, I mean, you didn't become a believer because you thought, I want to have the Holy Spirit in my life. No, you didn't do that. Your life was a mess, and you realized that sin had wreaked havoc in your life, and that you needed to have a Savior come in and correct that, and to save you from yourself, and to save you from the sin that had taken charge of your life. And so you were looking for a Savior to set you free from the sin that had taken power over your life, and that you wanted him to have control over your life. But you weren't thinking, oh, Lord, what I want you more than anything else is to, for you to give me your Holy Spirit. You probably didn't know anything about the Spirit at that moment. But when you came to faith, that's when you met the Spirit, because that's when Jesus Christ gave you his Holy Spirit. So not only did he forgive you of his sin, and not only did he give you the guarantee of life to come, but he put the Holy Spirit within you to know, so that you would know that you have that guarantee. You know, I, I, when Jesus was with his disciples, before the night that he was crucified, he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. John 14, 16, and 7. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. Let's put that up on the screen. Okay, we got it there? See, the world cannot accept him. Do you find it? It's there. There we go. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I mean, here's Jesus talking to his disciples at that point, and, he, and he's talking about what's going to happen. And so the point at this time is that they hadn't received the Spirit in their lives. And so he's going to give that Spirit. But he says, at this point, all Jesus says is that he was with you, and will be in you. So at this point, the Spirit was with them because it was in Jesus already, and Jesus was with them, and so the Spirit was with them as well through Jesus Christ. But the point that he's making is that the time is coming when he will be in you. See, that's the anointing that we're going to get, and that's the anointing that we have received if, if you're a follower of Christ. And that's why Jesus goes on to say in, in verse 26 of John 14, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago, but the counselor or the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. See, this is a promised gift that the Father for all of us has, has given to us by having faith in Jesus Christ. It's the gift of the Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit of truth that will lead us and guide us into all truth. Because, now listen to this verse, uh, or this passage. And I have much to say to you, Jesus, again, speaking to his disciples that night. I have much to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. And he will not speak on his own, but he will speak only of what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come, and I will bring glory, and he will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and make it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine, and that is why I say that the Spirit will receive from me that which he will make known to you. See, so that's the work of the Spirit in our lives. That's the anointing that he lets us know Jesus Christ. See, what's that telling us is that the anointing of the Spirit is the thing that brings life to us. 
That's what's the Holy Spirit's job. The Holy Spirit's job is to reveal to us Jesus Christ, to reveal, to show, to unveil, to, to instruct, to, to let us know Jesus Christ the way that Jesus wants us to know him. The Holy Spirit comes and does that in our, in our lives. So how do you know if a believer is walking in line with the Holy Spirit? How do you know if a, a preacher... Uh, uh, there are false teachers in that church. How did they know that the teachers that they heard and, and, and listened to their teaching, how did they know if they were teaching in line with the Spirit of God? How do you know? It's simple, isn't it? When you're done listening, I mean, what's the effect does it have on your life? Do you love Jesus more? Do you understand Jesus better? Do you want to follow him further? I mean, is that the response that you're feeling? Are you feeling that, that, man, this is right in line with the, the teaching of the word that I've heard before? I mean, if that's what you're feeling, my hunch is it's a good guess that the teacher who is teaching you is of the Spirit of God. See, when the Spirit is at work, Jesus will be glorified, won't he? And he'll be magnified, and he'll be exalted, and he'll be lifted high. It'll be about Jesus. That's what the spirit of truth does. He'll be lifted high above all things, above all people, above all powers, above all principalities. Because it's the Holy Spirit's pleasure to do that work. He guides us into the truth of knowing who Jesus Christ is. And that's why John will go on to say in, in 1 John 2, verse 22, as he continues in this section, who is a liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. I mean, there's truth, there's lies. So who is the liar? It's the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man, here he says, such a man is the Antichrist. You want to know who these people are that are telling you something wrong about Jesus Christ? He says, I'll tell you who they are. They're the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. And no one who denies the Son has the Father, and whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. You know, I, I think I've told you this before. The Bible is for you, but it's not about you. It's not about you. The Bible is about Jesus Christ, about the fact that God the Father sent Jesus Christ, about the fact that the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus Christ. Everything is about Jesus Christ. In the scriptures, the whole scripture points to Jesus Christ. And so the litmus test, when it comes down to, you know, if you're a true Christian or not, is who do you say that Jesus is? See, how do you know a true Christian from a false Christian? Do they hold to the truth of who Jesus Christ is? Because that's what the anointing of the Holy Spirit does in our lives. It leads us into the truth of knowing Jesus Christ. Do they remain in the truth as the gospel declares? And so real Christians, genuine Christians, remain in the church. They remain in the truth. There's one more thing that John wants us to understand. They remain in the word. Real Christians remain in the word. Here's how he says it. See that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will remain in the Son and the Father. And this is what he promises us even, eternal life. Our remaining in the Son and our remaining in the Father, what John is saying is hinges on the fact that we remain in the word that we've heard from the beginning when we first came to faith. And that's why, you know, when you look at our church, what's our church about? It's all about the word of God, isn't it? It's all about the word of God. That's what we do here. We preach the word. We teach the word. We exhort one another by the word. We admonish one another from the word. We encourage one another with the word. We spend time in the word. It's the word of God that's central to our faith. And that's why when people come along and, and say that the Bible is outdated, the Bible is, 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 you know, doesn't you know, relate well to a, the, the, the world that we're in today, doesn't deal with the issues, the Bible can't be trusted, okay, I mean, we recognize that because we're in the word here. That's, all that is false. All that is from people who don't know Christ. 
that the word no longer has a, has a connection with our culture today. But John says this in verse 27, As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you need not have anyone teach you. I mean, you've got the word. It's in you. The anointing of the Holy Spirit in you makes it so that he'll lead you so that you need no other teaching. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as he taught you, remain in him. What does the word teach us? Remain in him. That's the whole point of the word. In other words, it's the anointing of the Spirit on our lives that keeps us in the word. And as we're kept in the word, we're kept in Christ and we remain in God. See, God communicates to us basically through his word, doesn't he? The living and active, sharper than two-edged sword, piercing down into the very soul and spirit of our lives, revealing and discerning the hearts and thoughts of our mind. That's the word. That's what it does to us. And so what John is telling us is this. If you and I are believers, here's what we can, we know that we can have the assurance. He's writing for assurance, and he's saying, if you're a Christian, a genuine Christian, you're going to remain among the people of God. You're going to continue to allow the Holy Spirit to guide you into truth. And you're going to go to the Word day by day by day to find the nourishment that will give you sustenance for the life that you have. And that'll keep you in the faith. So my goal is not for us to spend time now trying to figure out who's a genuine Christian, who's not a genuine Christian in the church. That day will come. That, that'll be revealed someday, according to John. The, 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 the people who aren't real Christians will someday leave the community of faith, not to go to another church, but just to go nowhere at all. And it might be people who have a great influence in the church, like a Charles Templeton. But the going out will indicate that they never were of the faith. But you and I, we are of the faith, aren't we? I hope you are. And if you are, I mean, the assurance is there. You will remain. This is a, John will use that word over and over and over again to tell us that we're not going to walk away from faith. We're not going to lose the relationship we have with Jesus. But it's a relationship that will remain till we finally see him face to face. That's the assurance John wants us to know. Do you have it? I hope you do. Are you living by it? I hope you are. It makes all the difference in the world. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you again that you, you move us to, to help us recognize the fact that we don't have to be anxious. I mean, if we know your son, we don't have to be anxious that someday we will lose salvation or that we'll lose a relationship with you. It's never going to happen. You're here, and you've come into our lives through your Holy Spirit to keep us forever abiding with you. And so thank you for that gift so that we can live with great confidence that no matter what happens in this life that we're living with right now, I mean, there's salvation that is bringing us into your presence for all of eternity. So just give us the great, the great confidence that uh, we'll always be your children, that we'll be the children, they'll be actually, as you say, Father, as your son Jesus Christ said, that we'll be like sheep who hear your voice and follow him. Father, thank you for this good word to us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we close.
cornerstone and great hope in that cornerstone because Jesus Christ is not dead. He is alive. And we place our hope and our confidence in him. And that is good news. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So one fun thing to celebrate this morning, actually we have a lot of fun things to celebrate, but one in particular I want to point out are all these white roses over here on my left and your right. 19 individuals through FCA put their hope and trust in Jesus Christ. And that is fantastic. It's great news. They can now remain confident in Jesus, which is wonderful. A couple of other things I want to mention to you. Uh, this week is MEA break. So if you are, uh, have a student in student ministry, if you are in, in children's ministry involved in those, know that uh, we won't be here on Wednesday because it's break week this week. This yellow card that I have in my hand, we are always a church of prayer. But on Sunday nights, once a month, we gather and we pray over prayer requests that some of you submit, some of you send in cards, or you may email, or maybe you haven't yet, but let me encourage you to do so because we would love to pray with you and for you of any of the prayer needs that you might have that come up in and through your life. So these are in the, in the backs of the pews, so you can feel free to grab one and fill one out, or you can send us a, a note online through email, um, or there's a submission form where you can just type in a request that you may have and you'd like prayer for. And the last thing I'd like to mention is this, that we have men, an event coming up, that 
You know, it's been a long time since we've gotten together as a group of men here at this church. And on October 24th, we are going to gather for a men's breakfast. And I've got a fantastic speaker coming in from the cities to talk about what it means to be a man of God. And so on October 24th, sign up online through our website. But we would love to have you come and join us for those of you uh, men who are just looking to get together in fellowship and prayer and spend time together uh, in, your, in the Word of God. So go in the grace and peace of Jesus Christ this week. Remain in him and be confident that nothing can separate you from him as you remain connected to the Savior. Have a great week.